A Termist By Isaac Asimov Audiobook 1 of 1 A target is missed she laughed. The laughter grew and fed on itself till she was gasping for breath for breath and her plump face had reddened almost to purple. She leaned against the wall and gasped for breath. No, don't come closer, she begged. I'm all right. Bailey said gravely, is the possibility that humorous. She tried to answer and laughed again. Then, in a whisper, she said, Oh, you are an Earth man? How could it ever be me? You knew him well, said Bailey. You knew his habits. You could have planned it. And you think I would see him? That I would get close enough to bash him over the head with something? You just don't know anything at all about it, Bailey. Bailey felt himself redden. Why couldn't you get close enough to him, ma'am? You've had practice a mingling. With the children. One thing leads to another. You seem to be able to stand my presence. At twenty feet, she said contemptuously. I've just visited a man who nearly collapsed because he had to endure my presence for a while. Kiarissa sobered and said, a difference in degree. I suggest that a difference in degree is all that is necessary. The habit of seeing children makes it possible to endure seeing Dolmer just long enough. I would like to point out, Mr. Bailey, said Kiarissa no longer appearing the least amused, that it doesn't matter a speck what I can endure. Drive. Dolmere was the finicky one. He was almost as bad as Liebig himself. Almost. Even if I could endure seeing him, he would never endure seeing me. MRS. Dolmere is the only one he could possibly have allowed within seeing distance. Bailey said, who's this Liebig you mentioned? Kiarissa shrugged. One of these odd genius types, if you know what I mean. He's done work with the boss on robots. Bailey checked that off mentally and returned to the matter at hand. He said, it could also be said you had a motive. What motive? His death put you in charge of this establishment, gave you position. You call that a motive? Skies above? Who could want this position? Who on Solaria? This is a motive for keeping him alive. It's a motive for hovering over him and protecting him. You'll have to do better than that, Earthman. Bailey scratched his neck uncertainly with one finger. He saw the justice of that. Kiarissa said, Did you notice my ring, Mr. Bailey? For a moment it seemed she was about to strip the glove from her right hand, but she refrained. I noticed it, said Bailey. You don't know its significance, I suppose. I don't. He would never have done with ignorance, he thought bitterly. Do you mind a small lecture, then? If it will help me make sense of this damned world, blurted out Bailey, by all means. Skies above. Kiarissa smiled. I suppose we seem to you as Earth would seem to us. Imagine. Say, here's an empty chamber. Come in here and we'll sit down. No, the room's not big enough. Tell you what, though. You take a seat in there and I'll stand out here. She stepped farther down the corridor, giving him space to enter the room, then returned taking up her stand against the opposite wall at a point from which she could see him. Bailey took his seat with only the slightest quiver of chivalry countering it. He thought rebelliously. Why not? Let the spacer woman stand. Kiarissa folded her muscular arms across her chest and said, Gene analysis is the key to our society. We don't analyze for genes directly, of course. Each gene, However, governs one enzyme, and we can analyze for enzymes. Know the enzymes, know the body chemistry. Know the body chemistry, know the human being. You see all that. I understand the theory, said Bailey. 
I don't know how it's applied. That part's done here. Blood samples are taken while the infant is still in the late fetal stage. That gives us our rough first approximation. Ideally, we should catch all mutations at that point and judge whether birth can be risked. In actual fact, we still don't quite know enough to eliminate all possibility of mistake. Someday, maybe. Anyway, we continue testing after birth, biopsies as well as body fluids. In any case, long before adulthood, we know exactly what our little boys and girls are made of. Sugar and spice. A nonsense phrase went unbidden through Bailey's mind. We wear coated rings to indicate our gene constitution, said Kiarissa. It's an old custom, a bit of the primitive left behind from the days when solarions had not yet been weeded eugenically. Nowadays, we're all healthy. Bailey said, but you still wear yours. Why? Because I'm exceptional, she said with an unembarrassed, unblunted pride. Drive. Dolmer spent a long time searching for an assistant. He needed someone exceptional. Brains, ingenuity, industry, stability. Most of all, stability. Someone who could learn to mingle with children and not break down. He couldn't, could he? Was that a measure of his instability? Kiarissa said, in a way, it was, but at least it was a desirable type of instability under most circumstances. You wash your hands, don't you? Bailey's eyes dropped to his hands. They were as clean as need be. Yes, he said. All right. I suppose it's a measure of instability to feel such revulsion at dirty hands as to be unable to clean an oily mechanism by hand even in an emergency. Still, in the ordinary course of living, the revulsion keeps you clean, which is good. I see. Go ahead. There's nothing more. My genic health is the third highest ever recorded on Solaria, so I wear my ring. It's a record I enjoy carrying with me. I congratulate you. You needn't sneer. It may not be my doing. It may be the blind permutation of parental genes, but it's a proud thing to own, anyway. And no one would believe me capable of so seriously psychotic an act as murder. Not with my gene makeup. So don't waste accusations on me. Bailey shrugged and said nothing. The woman seemed to confuse gene makeup and evidence and presumably the rest of Solaria would do the same. Kiarissa said, do you want to see the youngsters now? Thank you. Yes. The corridors seemed to go on forever. The building was obviously a tremendous one. Nothing like the huge banks of apartments in the cities of Earth, of course but for a single building clinging to the outside skin of a planet it must be a mountainous structure. There were hundreds of cribs, with pink babies squalling, or sleeping, or feeding. Then there were playrooms for the crawlers. They're not too bad even at this age, said Kiarissa grudgingly, though they take up a tremendous sum of robots. It's practically a robot per baby till walking age. Why is that? They sicken if they don't get individual attention. Bailey nodded. Yes, I suppose the requirement for affection is something that can't be done away with. Kiarissa frowned and said brusquely, babies require attention. Bailey said, I am a little surprised that robots can fulfill the need for affection. She whirled toward him, the distance between them not sufficing to hide her displeasure. See here. Bailey, if you're trying to shock me by using unpleasant terms, you won't succeed. Skies above, don't be childish. Shock you. I can use the word too. Affection. Do you want a short word, a good four-letter word? I can say that, too. Love. Love. Now if it's out of your system, behave yourself. Bailey did not trouble to dispute the matter of obscenity. 
he said, can robots really give the necessary attention, then? Obviously, or this farm would not be the success it is. They fool with the child. They nuzzle it and snuggle it. The child doesn't care that it's only a robot. But then, things grow more difficult between three and ten. Oh. During that interval, the children insist on playing with one another. Quite indiscriminately. I take it you let them. We have to, but we never forget our obligation to teach them the requirements of adulthood. Each has a separate room that can be closed off. Even from the first, they must sleep alone. We insist on that. And then we have an isolation time every day and that increases with the years. By the time a child reaches ten, he is able to restrict himself to viewing for a week at a time. Of course, the viewing arrangements are elaborate. They can view outdoors, under mobile conditions, and can keep it up all day. Bailey said, I'm surprised you can counter an instinct so thoroughly. You do counter it, I see that. Still, it surprises me. What instinct? Demanded Kiarissa. The instinct of gregariousness. There is one. You say yourself that as children they insist on playing with each other. Kiarissa shrugged. Do you call that instinct? But then, what if it is? Skies above, a child has an instinctive fear of falling, but adults can be trained to work in high places even where there is constant danger of fabling. Haven't you ever seen gymnastic exhibitions on high wires? There are some worlds where people live in tall buildings. And children have instinctive fear of loud noises, too, but are you afraid of them? Not within reason, said Bailey. I'm willing to bet that Earth people couldn't sleep if things were really quiet. Skies above, there isn't an instinct around that can't give way to a good, persistent education. Not in human beings, where instincts are weak anyway. In fact, if you go about it right, education gets easier with each generation. It's a matter of evolution. Bailey said, how is that? Don't you see? Each individual repeats his own evolutionary history as he develops. Those fetuses back there have gills and a tail for a time. Can't skip those steps. The youngster has to go through the social animal stage in the same way. But just as a fetus can get through in one month a stage that evolution took a hundred million years to get through, so our children can hurry through the social animal stage. Drive Dolmere was of the opinion that with the generations, we'd get through that stage faster and faster. Is that so? In three thousand years, he estimated, at the present rate of progress, we'd have children who'd take to viewing at once. The boss had other notions, too. He was interested in improving robots to the point of making them capable of disciplining children without becoming mentally unstable. Why not? Discipline today for a better life tomorrow is a true expression of first law if robots could only be made to see it. Have such robots been developed yet? Kiarissa shook her head. I'm afraid not. Drive. Dolmer and Liebig had been working hard on some experimental models. Did drive. Dolmer have some of the models sent out to his estate? Was he a good enough roboticist to conduct tests himself? Oh yes. He tested robots frequently. Do you know that he had a robot with him when he was murdered? I've been told so. Do you know what kind of a model it was? You'll have to ask Liebig. As I told you, he's the roboticist who worked with Drive. Dolmer. You know nothing about it. Not a thing. If you think of anything, let me know. I will. And don't think new robot models are all that drive. Dolmer was interested in. Drive. Dolmer used to say the time would come when unfertilized ova would be stored in banks at liquid air temperatures and utilized for artificial insemination. 
In that way, eugenic principles could be truly applied and we could get rid of the last vestige of any need for seeing. I'm not sure that I quite go along with him so far, but he was a man of advanced notions, a very good Solarion. She added quickly, Do you want to go outside? The five through eight group are encouraged to take part in outdoor play and you could see them in action. Bailey said cautiously, I'll try that. I may have to come back inside on rather short notice. Oh yes, I forgot. Maybe you'd rather not go out at all. No. Bailey forced a smile. I'm trying to grow accustomed to the outdoors. The wind was hard to bear. It made breathing difficult. It wasn't cold, in a direct physical sense, but the feel of it, the feel of his clothes moving against his body, gave Bailey a kind of chill. His teeth chattered when he tried to talk and he had to force his words out in little bits. It hurt his eyes to look so far at a horizon so hazy green and blue and there was only limited relief when he looked at the pathway immediately before his toes. Above all, he avoided looking up at the empty blue, empty, that is, but for the piled up white of occasional clouds and the glare of the naked sun. And yet he could fight off the urge to run, to return to enclosure. He passed a tree, following Kiarissa by some ten paces, and he reached out a cautious hand to touch it. It was rough and hard to the touch. Frondi leaves moved and rustled overhead but he did not raise his eyes to look at them. A living tree. Kiarissa called out. How do you feel? All right. You can see a group of youngsters from here, she said. They're involved in some kind of game. The robots organize the games and see to it that the little animals don't kick each other's eyes out. With personal presence you can do just that, you know. Bailey raised his eyes slowly, running his glance along the cement of the pathway out to the grass and down the slope, farther and farther out very carefully ready to snap back to his toes if he grew frightened feeling with his eyes. There were the small figures of boys and girls racing madly about, uncaring that they raced at the very outer rim of a world with nothing but air and space above them. The glitter of an occasional robot moved nimbly among them. The noise of the children was a far-off incoherent squeaking in the air. They love it, said Kiarissa. Pushing and pulling and squabbling and falling down and getting up and just generally contacting. Skies above. How do children ever manage to grow up? What are those older children doing? Asked Bailey. He pointed at a group of isolated youngsters standing to one side. They're viewing. They're not in a state of personal presence. By viewing, they can walk together, talk together, race together, play together. Anything except physical contact. Where do children go when they leave here? To estates of their own. The number of deaths is, on the average, equal to the number of graduations. To their parents' estates. Skies above, no. It would be an amazing coincidence, wouldn't it, to have a parent die just as a child is of age. No, the children take any one that falls vacant. I don't know that any of them would be particularly happy, anyway, living in a mansion that once belonged to their parents, supposing, of course, they knew who their parents were. Don't they? She raised her eyebrows. Why should they? Don't parents visit their children here? What a mind you have. Why should they want to? Bailey said, Do you mind if I clear up a point for myself? Is it bad manners to ask a person if they have had children? It's an intimate question, wouldn't you say? In a way. I'm hardened. Children are my business. Other people aren't. Bailey said, have you any children? Kyrissa's Adam's apple made a soft but clearly visible motion in her throat as she swallowed. I deserve that, I suppose. And you deserve an answer. I haven't. Are you married? Yes, 
and I have an estate of my own and I would be there but for the emergency here. I'm just not confident of being able to control all the robots if I'm not here in person. She turned away unhappily, and then pointed. Now there's one of them gone tumbling and of course he's crying. A robot was running with great space devouring strides. Kiarissa said, he'll be picked up and cuddled and if there's any real damage, I'll be called in. She added nervously, I hope I don't have to be. Bailey took a deep breath. He noted three trees forming a small triangle fifty feet to the left. He walked in that direction, the grass soft and loathsome under his shoes, disgusting in its softness, like walking through corrupting flesh, and he nearly retched at the thought. He was among them, his back against one trunk. It was almost like being surrounded by imperfect walls. The sun was only a wavering series of glitters through the leaves, so disconnected as almost to be robbed of horror. Kiarissa faced him from the path, then slowly shortened the distance by half. Mind if I stay here a while? Asked Bailey. Go ahead, said Kiarissa. Bailey said, once the youngsters graduate out of the farm, how do you get them to court one another? Court. Get to know one another, said Bailey, vaguely wondering how the thought could be expressed safely, so they can marry. That's not their problem, said Kiarissa. They're matched by gene analysis, usually when they are quite young. That's the sensible way, isn't it? Are they always willing? To be married? They never are. It's a very traumatic process. At first they have to grow accustomed to one another, and a little bit of seeing each day, once the initial queasiness is gone, can do wonders. What if they just don't like their partner? What? If the gene analysis indicates a partnership what difference does it I understand, said Bailey hastily. He thought of Earth and sighed. Kiarissa said, is there anything else you would like to know? Bailey wondered if there were anything to be gained from a longer stay. He would not be sorry to be done with Kiarissa and fetal engineering so that he might pass on to the next stage. He had opened his mouth to say as much, when Kiarissa called out at some object far off, You, child, you there. What are you doing? Then, over her shoulder. Earthman. Bailey. Watch out. Watch out. Bailey scarcely heard her. He responded to the note of urgency in her voice. The nervous effort that held his emotions taut snapped wide and he flamed into panic. All the terror of the open air and the endless vault of heaven broke in upon him. Bailey gibbered. He heard himself mouth meaningless sounds and felt himself fall to his knees and slowly roll over to his side as though he were watching the process from a distance. Also from a distance he heard the sighing hum piercing the air above him and ending with a sharp thwack. Bailey closed his eyes and his fingers clutched a thin tree root that schemed the surface of the ground and his nails burrowed into dirt. He opened his eyes, it must only have been moments after. Kiarissa was scolding sharply at a youngster who remained at a distance. A robot, silent, stood closer to Kiarissa. Bailey had only time to notice the youngster held a stringed object in his hand before his eyes sheared away. Breathing heavily, Bailey struggled to his feet. He stared at the shaft of glistening metal that remained in the trunk of the tree against which he had been standing. He pulled at it and it came out readily. It had not penetrated far. He looked at the point but did not touch it. It was blunted, but it would have sufficed to tear his skin had he not dropped when he did. It took him two tries to get his legs moving. He took a step toward Kiarissa and called, You. Youngster. Kiarissa turned, her face flushed. She said, It was an accident. Are you hurt? No. What is this thing? It's an arrow. It is fired by a bow, which makes a taut string do the work. Like this, called the youngster impudently, 
and he shot another arrow into the air, then burst out laughing. He had light hair and a lithe body. Kiarissa said, You will be disciplined. Now leave. Wait, wait, cried Bailey. He rubbed his knee where a rock had caught and bruised him as he had fallen. I have some questions. What is your name? Rick, he said carelessly. Did you shoot that arrow at me, Rick? That's right, said the boy. Do you realize you would have hit me if I hadn't been warned in time to duck? Rick shrugged. I was aiming to hit. Kiarissa spoke hurriedly. You must let me explain. Archery is an encouraged sport. It is competitive without requiring contact. We have contests among the boys using viewing only. Now I'm afraid some of the boys will aim at robots. It amuses them and it doesn't hurt the robots. I'm the only adult human on the estate and when the boy saw you, he must have assumed you were a robot. Bailey listened. His mind was clearing, and the natural dourness of his long face intensified. He said, Rick, did you think I was a robot? No, said the youngster. You're an Earth man. All right. Go now. Rick turned and raced off whistling. Bailey turned to the robot. You. How did the youngster know I was an Earth man, or weren't you with him when he shot? I was with him, Master. I told him you were an Earth man. Did you tell him what an Earth man was? Yes, Master. What is an Earth man? An inferior sort of human that ought not to be allowed on Solana because he breeds disease, Master. And who told you that, boy? The robot maintained silence. Bailey said, Do you know who told you? I do not, Master. It is in my memory store. So you told the boy I was a disease breeding inferior and he immediately shot at me. Why didn't you stop him? I would have, Master. I would not have allowed harm to come to a human, even an Earth man. He moved too quickly and I was not fast enough. Perhaps you thought I was just an Earth man, not completely a human and hesitated a bit. No, Master. It was said with quiet calm, but Bailey's lips quirked grimly. The robot might deny it in all faith, but Bailey felt that was exactly the factor involved. Bailey said, What were you doing with the boy? I was carrying his arrows, Master. May I see them? He held out his hand. The robot approached and delivered a dozen of them. Bailey put the original arrow, the one that had hit the tree, carefully at his feet, and looked the others over one by one. He handed them back and lifted the original arrow again. He said, Why did you give this particular arrow to the boy? No reason, Master. He had asked for an arrow some time earlier and this was the one my hand touched first. He looked about for a target then noticed you and asked who the strange human was. I explained I know what you explained. This arrow you handed him is the only one with grey veins at the rear. The others have black veins. The robot simply stared. Bailey said, Did you guide the youngster here? We walked randomly, Master. The Earthman looked through the gap between two trees through which the arrow had hurled itself toward its mark. He said, would it happen, by any chance, that this youngster, Rick, was the best archer you have here? The robot bent his head. He is the best, master. Kiarissa gaped. How did you ever come to guess that? It follows, said Bailey dryly. Now please observe this grey-veined arrow and the others. The grey-veined arrow is the only one that seems oily at the point. I'll risk melodrama, ma'am, by saying that your warning saved my life. This arrow that missed me is poisoned. The End Audiobook generated by, Read With The Ears